hear me? In the back? Frank, great. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for inviting us, uh, me tonight, to uh, speak to you guys about Cassandra and how we use it at uh, Gamefly. Um, start off with a, a quick little overview as to uh, uh, you know, what Gamefly is, in case some of you don't know. Uh, a little bit about what I do there and uh, of how that's evolved over time and how that's led to uh, us actually using Cassandra at Gamefly. Um, specifically, we actually built something uh, that's social in nature uh, using uh, Cassandra. And then I'll dig deeper into uh, Cassandra and kind of give a, a broad uh, overview of the, the features that were appealing to us. And uh, you, know, you know, feel free to ask questions throughout. I'll try to answer them as best I can. And uh, then at the end, we'll have some more questions and, and Kind of at the end of the, the uh, presentation. So, uh, Gamefly, I, just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Gamefly? That's actually a lot more than I usually get. So, uh, that's cool. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> for those who don't know what Gamefly is, we're a, a rental uh, uh, subscription based game rental business. That was our core initial. Um, revenue stream, and uh, from there we've spawned off other ones like buying and selling of games. Um, specifically, we have focused in the past on the console systems, and then later on the portable systems, and we've moved out into, uh, most recently, into digital downloads for uh, PCs, and now we're starting to look at uh, mobile platforms, phones, I iOS, Android, tablets, that sort of thing, trying to figure out where we can either build out a rental business or a sell game business. Um, in that space. And then we have a couple other properties you may have heard of, Shack News and um, uh, Moby Games, and they're sort of uh, our, our content arms, and we use those to sort of build out what we can provide around the gaming experience, you know, cheat codes, uh, other bits of information about gaming, screenshots, that sort of thing, just to kind of give you a, a greater feel for what a product, a game product is. Um, so about uh, two and a half years ago now, around the first of the year in 2010, I came in to, to work there uh, specifically on uh, mobile games, uh, mobile applications. Um, I had worked previously uh, for a number of years at Fandango. I was the director of data systems there, uh, basically working on making sure that we could sell movie tickets on a Friday when Spider-Man or Batman or whatever big comic book movie came out. Um, and I was looking for something new, and I had actually done the Fandango iPhone app initially, uh, right when it came out in 2008. Uh, and I was really looking to move in that direction. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for me at uh, Fandango, and I found Gamefly. They didn't have anything having to do with mobile. Obviously, tablets weren't around back then. So uh, we sort of got together. One thing led to another. And so that was the start of what, uh, what we do today. Uh, initially, then, there was nobody in that group. Now there's 10 people that do uh, mobile development, whether it's phones or tablets, uh, or even website development, uh, specifically tailored to, to mobile uh, browsers. Um, so when we were kind of looking at what we could do, we were looking at this mobile space and we were thinking, well, you know, Gamefly is whatever it is today, well, maybe we can reimagine it. Maybe we can uh, interface with new customers using phones and eventually tablets. And, you know, we have looked at televisions and tried to figure out ways we could move our platform onto that as well. Uh, so my group sort of had this new, new vision for what we could do, try and reinvent Gamefly, take it to a, a broader audience make it a little bit more of a compelling experience, more convenient. Um, so uh, along with that, one of the things that we wanted to do was to take all these different properties that we had, the, the Shack News and the Moby Games and the Gamefly.com pieces, and kind of bring them together under one umbrella product, one product that was just super convenient. Um, the interesting thing about that was that we were successful at doing that. We were very successful at doing that. But what we found was that our users wanted something else. They, they, they had these connected devices. They could do all sorts of interesting things with them. If you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, if you were maybe buying a ticket on Fandango, let's say. But in our space, you could like manage your queue, and you could read about a, a game, and you could watch a video. But it was, it was, it sort of was lacking. And we heard feedback from customers saying that they wanted to be able to engage in the gamer community. And so we thought about working with the Twitters and the Facebooks of the world. Um, but we're kind of a smaller company. We're not like a Netflix or a Facebook or Twitter for that matter. And so uh, we decided we'd just try and build it ourselves. We, we didn't really think it would be that complicated, especially on our scale, since we were specifically talking about working with uh, just the gamer community. So 
you know, the next question really was, okay, we're going to do social. We know what it's going to be. We want it to be the social stream where information's coming in uh, pretty much all the time, that gamers can communicate with each other about anything. It could be, uh, you know, whatever they would normally say on Twitter, or it could be about a news article that we had on Jack News, or it could be about a video game that they're excited about that's coming around the corner, uh, or it could be about a trailer that they hate about a video game. It could be a contextual, or it could be just generic. Um, we kind of knew that was what we wanted to, to mold our uh, social stream around. Uh, we knew we eventually wanted to integrate it with all of our properties, uh, which we, to this day, still have not done. But we also knew that we wanted it to be fast, and scalable, and stable. Um, and we absolutely had no idea how to do any of this. Um, so, you know, we looked around, based on our prior experiences doing uh, other other products at other properties, you know, the San Diego's of the world as an example, uh, we, we knew there were a couple things that might run, that we might run into that might be problems, and that was, how do you scale systems like that? How do you do things of that nature when we hadn't done those in the past? Because Gamefly was a, a retail business, it was a commerce business. It didn't have the same constraints that uh, a social platform might have. Even uh, the closest thing we had was something called Shack News that had a forum type system, but even then it was, more long form, not a lot of back and forth, sort of more like a, a chat system, for lack of a better way of thinking about it. So we looked at Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, Reddit and some others, MySpace, um, and we we tried to understand how they built their systems, what were the things that were pain points for them, and what were the things that they did right or that they learned the hard way and we hopefully wouldn't have to learn. Um, and the one big takeaway was massive data, massive usage, uh, leads to sort of massive scale problems. Um, and so we looked at how they scale. Um, ironically enough, as a side note, Cassandra came out of Facebook. <clears throat> but Cassandra uh, was actually built off of white papers from Google and from Amazon. So it's sort of living on top of the learnings of lots of other companies in the long run. Um, so Facebook was actually using it uh, for a while as the backbone for their uh, mail pro uh, product within the, uh, the platform. Um, they've actually since moved on. Uh, they, had, they bought a couple of companies that were HBase experts and sort of pushed Cassandra out uh, over time and now they do HBase. It doesn't mean that Cassandra isn't necessarily a good product. Though. It just means that they had expertise in a different area. So anyway, how do they scale? Uh, <clears throat> That was sort of the core thing, and we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't know anybody. We didn't know how to ask that question of anybody else. You know, down here, MySpace was, I guess, maybe the biggest similar player. Um, I actually have a friend that works there. Uh, we learned they spent a lot of money on hardware, and they had a lot of scaling problems. And they were traditionally a Microsoft shop, and they just had a lot of problems. And so we knew we kind of didn't want to go that route. We, we, Gamefly is a Microsoft shop in its history. Um, but we knew we just didn't want to pick those technologies. So again, going back to the other companies that I mentioned earlier, they all tended to look for creative solutions to these problems. We knew that for scaling social, there were a couple things we cared about. We wanted to be nimble, fast, uh, flexible, scalable, and available. And so what did those things mean to us? Well, since we didn't really know what to expect, we, what nimble meant to us was we needed to be able to get into the code potentially in real time, make a change if need be, deploy that change, not have to bring down all the infrastructure along the way. Um, we knew we wanted to be flexible in the sense that we wanted to have the stack be flexible so that it could evolve easily. The code base could be flexible by its nature. The database could be hopefully flexible by its nature. Um, every piece sort of had that capability hopefully built in, in some fashion, not necessarily at the architectural level of what we do. Um, maybe it's something that we're taking uh, the underpinnings from and we're using. Uh, something that's kind of already got that flexibility built in and we're just leveraging and sitting on top of it. Um, we knew that we needed it to be scalable. For us that really meant that if we got a big spike in user traffic and we needed another database server to help us out to, to handle load, uh, we could supposedly add one on, so to speak, and everything would be hunky-dory. Um, it's not always true in Cassandra that that works that way, but you don't have that flexibility normally in traditional databases. And we also knew we wanted that same flexibility at our web applications here. Uh, lastly, we wanted it to be always up. Um, there's an interesting sort of caveat side note to that. Our system can always be up, but we're sort of dependent on the mothership in some respects. 
and the mothership is not always up. So we're up, and sometimes they're not. Um, but for us, that meant that if we're going to do upgrades to the software, uh, whether it's the database or you know the operating system or what have you, uh, we could do something so that we could always have like rolling upgrades would be sort of the, the preferred strategy. So we're never down, we're never losing data, things are always working. Um, that was another area that we were looking for. Uh, so that's how we thought of scaling social. It doesn't necessarily mean how the Reddits and the Twitters and the Facebooks looked at it, but not knowing how they did it, that's what we were looking to do. Um, so the philosophy from a, a software perspective for us and a hardware perspective was we needed to always be able to add. That was add or subtract. Uh, we never really thought too much about subtracting, but you know we wanted that flexibility. We wanted to be able to say, if need be, we could always move forward and without a lot of pain. Um, so one of the things that that led us to was how, how do you get hardware? Like you can't go down to Fry's and get a big server and well maybe you can, but uh, I don't know how, how stable that piece of hardware is going to be. And then you take it down to your data center and oh wait, it's 2 a.m. and you need to call the IT guy and get them down there. And so that was a challenge, thinking about the hardware piece, that was a challenge. But then if, let's say we could solve the hardware challenge, then we had the software challenge, which is all the pieces I just mentioned. How do we do that? How are we going to do that if we can get the hardware at any time? So we wanted to have easily sourced hardware, always on demand. Uh, we wanted to be able to take, take advantage of that as quickly as we could. And we wanted to have horizontal scaling be a core tenant of every tier of our application infrastructure. Uh, so there were obviously presents some challenges to that. Um, where do you get hardware on demand? Well, up until recently, that wasn't really feasible. Um, but things have changed. And so now, the, you know, whether or not you were going the route of procuring hardware from a Dell or an HP and waiting four or five, six weeks, and then hoping and praying that it can get into the data center rack and all that in a short period of time, or you could use this thing called the cloud, potentially. And so, you know, that's where we started kind of, we had no experience in the cloud. We had no idea who to use or, you know, how successful it was. Um, so we, we started looking into that. Uh, another architectural challenge for us was, okay, if we want to be nimble and flexible, the first two tenants that we described uh, earlier, how do we do that in the software tier? Is it easy for us to make a change and, okay, we're deploying a DLL, we got to stop IIS, or, you know, you're maybe putting up a jar and you got, got to do some other stuff where you stop and start something else. Uh, and you got to compile it, and you, you can't do it right on the server potentially, or if you do, maybe it seizes something while the server is doing that. Um, so we were looking at statically typed languages versus dynamically typed languages, and trying to see what was the, the most flexible uh, and sort of fit our needs. Um, and so that was the second challenge. And then the third challenge was, okay, so these database systems, how do you get them to scale? Whether or not it's a relational database, or a Cassandra database, or a Mongo database, or Oracle, how do you get them to scale and hopefully it doesn't cost a lot of money along the way. And then lastly, uh, we, looking at scaling, we wanted to make sure that we weren't maybe every couple of months as things started to grow exponentially, hopefully, going back and re-architecting. Yes? What do you mean by horizontally scaling? Uh, just that we're able to add more hardware and expand the software across that hardware. So if you start with, traditionally you might start with one database server. And then let's say you wanted to add another one. If you're in a relational world, you may not have configured your schema in such a way that it can be replicated easily. So now you've got to go refactor the schema so that you could add another machine so that you could take on more traffic and more load into your infrastructure. So we were trying to, trying to avoid that. Uh, some of us had experienced some pain points along the way at other companies with problems like that. We were hoping to avoid that if we could up front. Sometimes people say, you know, don't over, uh, Getting it right now, but don't over architect in advance, don't over optimize. Some people have told me that we try to do too much too fast. Well, the way we work at Gamefly, we don't always have the opportunity to go back because somebody else wants you to move forward. So we were sort of like, well, we got this one shot, let's see how far we can go, how flexible and scalable and nimble it'll be. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about the hardware decisions, again, it was about procuring uh, hard hardware from a vendor, and that takes time, and then you get it shipped, and then you get it. Into your, in, into your office, and then some IT guy has to become available, he has to put down the operating system, drive it down to the data center, all that stuff has to happen. That was the traditional way we worked at Gamefly. We knew that that was going to be probably impossible due to uh, resource constraints within our company. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about deploy our own, 
or build our own or try the cloud. And uh, after spending a little bit of time looking at the vendors that were out there, uh, we pretty much decided the cloud was for us. And uh, you know, we looked at these three, Amazon, uh, Heroku, and um, Rackspace, but the maturity and the, the, the feature set that we could get from Amazon sort of just drew us into that space. Um, maybe it wasn't the cheapest solution, um, but it seems to have a lot of things and they, they evolved their infrastructure very quickly. And that, those are th two things we really liked. Again, being able to leverage others and the work they've done. Um, so just as a final note on that, why did we choose the cloud? Well, we were a new engineering group. We had, at the time that we were doing this, we had two resources, myself and one other person. Uh, we had limited to no access to other engineering resources within the organization, and they were traditionally from a Microsoft background, so they probably weren't going to be able to help us even if they were available. Uh, we needed infrastructure that could scale, which means we needed to be able to get these things at any time. We needed to be able to get small ones, big ones, super big ones, uh, configured in different ways with the X number of drives. All of that became available to us as soon as we went with the cloud solution. You could kind of design it on the fly if you wanted to. Um, we needed it to be uh, in more than one location eventually. We haven't actually gotten to this, but we like the idea that you could actually scale your infrastructure from just being a one data center to three or four data centers. Um, and then lastly, this point about horizontally or vertically, it just meant that like, if our infrastructure needed more CPUs inside three machines instead of going to 30 machines, we had that option just as well as we had the option to add more hardware, just additively buying more boxes. So, the flexibility that the cloud offered really uh, catered to what we needed at the time. Um, so in the software space, you know, we were looking at uh, obviously uh, cheap stuff. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we, you know, we were uh, trying to stand on top of those who had done some amazing things before us and wherever we could cut costs. Um, so we spent a lot of time looking at open source products. Um, we also wanted the software to be as flexible as this hardware solution we had found. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could uh, change it very easily. This was that nimble piece I mentioned earlier. Um, and we wanted, as new people came on board, because again, we were only two people, we wanted to be able to say, if we documented this fairly well, hopefully you could come in and take that software that we hopefully documented very, very well, and there would be a low learning curve to making you actually productive in, in our uh, infrastructure. Um, then we had some other tenants, which were really just to keep the software as simple as we could, uh, as modular as we could so that it was as easy to test as possible. Uh, this did mean that there were going to be some sacrifices that we made and we were going to sort of do a trade-off. We, we realized if we're going to go with uh, a, a dynamic language, one that you could change pretty much uh, on the fly anytime, anywhere inside a little piece of so you know, software that's running on the third server, or the fifth server within your web tier sort of thing, we knew that that meant that uh, we were probably going to sacrifice a little bit of performance. Um, but we were willing to make that trade-off. If we had a slightly lower performance over here, we might add another server at a later date. So by sort of saying, okay, we don't need to be super fast or super, super uh, sophisticated in our software, we were kind of leveraging this fact that we could add more later in the hardware space and then put our software on top of it. So, uh, you know, we did some experiments with Java, uh, but we kind of quickly moved away from that, and that was predominantly the only language we looked at that wasn't a dynamically typed language. Uh, we looked at Ruby uh, and Python. Um, we liked those more than PHP uh, because at the time we were really playing around with the interactive shells. Uh, I found out later that there was a PHP shell that came out of Facebook. I didn't know that at the time. Um, so we were really playing with Ruby. We actually really loved Ruby, uh, but it was uh, difficult to do some things that we wanted to do. We wanted to have the ability to do uh, threading-like behaviors without having to write threads, and there was something called event machine that was sort of this thing that could kind of do that, uh, but it was like poorly documented, and there was one guy who seemed to know everything, and it was really hard to understand. So um, we ended up going towards Python, um, and then specifically we ended up using something similar to uh, event machine called Tornado, which is uh, a, an event uh, loop uh, web server it allows you to do asynchronous communication, sort of like a threading model, um, but you don't have to like get into the weeds about doing threading. Um, lastly, uh, before we get into Cassandra, we needed a, we had a search requirement. Um, again, in my past, I had done some work with uh, Indeca, which is a really, really expensive mm -hmm. uh, product that I recently got bought by somebody, and I don't even remember who it was. Oracle. There we go, Oracle. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, they were like three hundred thousand dollars or something like that when we, we used them at the, a prior company of mine. And we had actually done a, a prototype at that time with solar, and it did everything we needed, and we still went and bought Indeca. So uh, we decided again to uh, use open source, and so we took solar. And then again, we spent some time looking at databases, but uh, we had a lot of experience on the team of three people uh, working on relational systems, and we knew some of the uh, the cons that we didn't really want to face, and so we were really looking for alternatives to uh, relational systems, things that could have scalability sort of as a core tenant of their systems. Uh, didn't mean obviously that there probably were gonna be some sacrifices along the way. Um, and so we looked a little bit at MongoDB, uh, Tokyo Cabinet, I think it was called at the time, um, and did some light research on uh, React and Redis. Uh, I had been following uh, Cassandra for a while because uh, I knew about the, the Google Big Table uh, and Amazon Dynamo uh, model that it sort of leveraged to grow out and to build off of, so it was pretty much sort of ingrained in me, I think, at some point that I really just wanted to try this and see if I could make it work. And so that's what led me to Cassandra. Um, so, like I said, you know, we, the, the, the big table and Dynamo white papers were very interesting. They, they accomplished a flexible data model and sort of the horizontal scalability. They, they each did these one thing very well, and Facebook, when they built Cassandra, they basically said, Let's see if we can put these two things together. Um, that really appealed to me. I liked having the flexibility at the data layer, and I liked having the flexibility of being able to add servers and, and bring another machine up, have it replicate, sort of <coughs> distribute the data that it had on two machines, let's say, to three machines, without me really having to do anything. I, that seems kind of like black magic to me. Um, so then as we dug in, you know, the flexible data model really started to come, come to light. It, it took a little while for us to go from a relational thinking to a non-relational thinking. Um, typically, you, you think in rows when you're talking about relational systems, and then you might be joining those rows up and ordering them and doing data manipulation, I'll call it on the fly. Uh, Cassandra doesn't want you to work that way. Cassandra wants you to work the inverse. Think of it more like a denormalized uh, database like you're doing a data warehouse. Like you want to have a static representation at the time you write it. And that seems not very flexible, but the model that you, the, the the data objects that you use inside the system are flexible, but the way you write the data is maybe not necessarily so flexible. Um, the replication piece that I talked about. So the ability to basically say today I have three machines and they all have three copies of data, and I didn't have to do anything to make those three copies exist. And now I want to add four more machines, and I want to have that three copies now be sort of striped, for lack of a better way of thinking it, across the seven machines, and I don't have to do anything other than bring those machines up and add them to this gossip architecture, which is basically just a way for the machines to coordinate with one another. But it all happens down at the Cassandra layer. I'm not doing it. I'm bringing the machines up, I'm saying, you know about you, and you know about you, and you know about you, and the rest happens within the infrastructure itself, within the Cassandra infrastructure. That was really appealing, and then later on, uh, they introduced the ability to do that uh, in a wide area network. So now you could have a, a data center in Los Angeles with three machines, and you could have a data center in New York with three machines, and that same thing I described, when you bring up the three machines locally, could happen across a LAN. There will obviously be the speed of light in preventing you from getting your copy over there and however much time that takes to get from LA to New York, but your data will get there, and it'll happen all without you really having to do much. Um, which, again, like I said, if, if you need to have that, that was really appealing. Uh, at the time that we were first looking at Cassandra, it was uh, Cassandra 06. Now they're up to uh, one, two is in beta. Um, it had very, very fast writes. Its writes were actually, I think, four times faster than its reads, which is not traditionally how a database works, um, which just seemed amazing. I was, I, that sort of just drew me just for that alone. But the second question was, why are your reads so slow? Um, and they couldn't really give a, a legitimate answer to that. It was more because the writes were just amazingly fast. Um, and, but eventually, in, in around uh, 1.0 of Cassandra, they actually had the reads are now about, I think they're like 10% slower than writes, whereas they were like 400% slower before. And the writes waiting for the monkeys to copy it over. <laughs> yeah, and the writes didn't slow down, by the way. It wasn't like they just sort of brought it down. When you say you write the data across the, the WAN, is mm -hmm. that uh, in, in async mode or asynchronous mode? Um, Can you choose? It's, uh, 
they don't really think of it as asynchronous and synchronous. It has to do with what's called a consistency level. Um, and everything in Cassandra is uh, what's called eventual consistency, so it doesn't follow the traditional asset uh, model. So if you say, we're getting a little off, and I'll touch on it later, but I'm happy to bring it up now. When you say I have a, a row of data, uh, and I want that row of data to be in three places within my architecture, you may be writing your, your PHP or your Python uh, code may be calling into the system, and it connects to one machine within the system, and it writes there. And the other two copies will eventually be written. There will, they will be written, there won't be lost, because of the way it writes to a, uh, it writes to in memory and to a commit log in an append only manner on the one system that got it before it gives you a response. So you'll get that data somewhere, and then the eventual consistency part will happen at a later date. Uh, later date, you know, less than one second. It, you know, in the, in the WAN case, maybe a little over a second, depending on your, your connection between LA and New York, let's say. But, um, It'll get there, and it's guaranteed to be written once you get a success path. Um, so the fast writes were really appealing, um, and then, like I said, as they matured the, the product, the, the reads became uh, equally fast, and that was that was a nice feature uh, to, to have fast writes and fast reads. Um, and then, lastly, this whole idea that you can have sort of x number of machines, and then add ten more machines, and then add ten more machines, sort of leaves you with this notion that you can have a lot of data can have an insane amount of data, quite frankly, because you just got to put some disk behind it, and you, you just got to make sure that you can have uh, enough uh, servers to hold all the data that you want, and you know, depending on what you're actually doing with the data, you, you probably won't have it all in memory, but uh, you'll be able to have access to it pretty quickly. Um, so the, the one uh, major limitation currently in Cassandra, just so you guys are aware, is that one row can only have two billion columns, in, in case that was a a limitation that was a concern. Uh, but it can have billions and billions of rows. Uh, so the data model, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so traditionally in a relational database you have a table, uh, rows and columns. The columns are defined at uh, creation time of the table and they're, they're fixed. Uh, every row looks the same. If it's got 10 columns defined, every row has 10 columns and if you don't populate those columns you usually put null data or empty string or whatever. Um, so the rough equivalent to that in Cassandra is a column family. Uh, I guess I should back up and say that Cassandra thinks of itself as a column-oriented data store. Uh, so they call it a column family instead of a table. Um, so what is a column family? Well, a column family is it has a primary key, it has a row lookup ID, just like a traditional database does. Um, and then it has basically name value pairs that make up these rows and these columns, these, you know, the, the, the 10 columns that we talked about in a table, you could have those same 10 columns in a Cassandra uh, column family. However, let's say one row is a user profile row and it has a username and a password and a couple other data points. Let's say the second row, you don't have a username yet. It doesn't create a field called username and put a null value in. It just doesn't exist. So you end up with one row that might have 10 columns and one row that might have two columns. So you get you know, variability in the shape of the data that you're storing inside one column pen. Um, data type is the key, the row key. Um, it can be variable. Uh, you can define it in advance. So in the definition of a column family, there's a, there's, you can define the column names. This is jumping ahead couple steps, but you can also define the row key as being of a certain kind. So it could be an integer type, it could be, there's something called a time UUID, which is sort of like uh, supposedly globally unique value. So oftentimes in Cassandra we use that as opposed to a sequence or a... Well, what's, what's the default? There is no default. You have to oh, define you have it. To define you it. have to define it. Yeah. Um, you can also do composite keys, which traditionally might look like something like a, an integer, a colon, and another integer, a colon. But you can actually define that in something called a, a you can create a type that actually defines the structure of this multi-part key. Um, one of the more interesting things about column families, because you have these dynamic rows, these different shaped rows, um, you can actually think of it as being both a data structure that can be statically defined, meaning you can always enforce to have a row look the same, every row look the same if you want it to, but you have to enforce that when you're inserting the records. Uh, the other side of that coin is you can have it be a dynamically row can have a different shape. Uh, 
the major the, or the the, the uh, traditional example case for that is timeline or time series data. You know, instead of um, I don't even know off the top of my head how you do this in a traditional database, but um, you would probably have some some field called date, and you'd be ordering off of that, and the data might necessarily get stored in that particular order, unless you have like a, a sorted uh, a sorted on disk index on that, but um, you could be writing data into that in every column, and you could have hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands, whatever number of rows that you want. In Cassandra, the way you would do that is you make one row, which has much better I.O. read, uh, and you would just stri write out that data as different columns, and you'd hang off of that. Each column uh, name would actually be a timestamp, and then off of that, you'd actually put into it whatever you want. So let's say you had uh, 400 tweets, just as an example, over three years. That would be one row with 400 columns, and then the timestamp for each tweet would be a column name, and then whatever you want to hang off of that, the, the post, uh, a picture, a video, URL, whatever you want, that would all be sort of bundled into uh, the column values. The column name is the timestamp, and the column values can be a string, an integer, or it can be a complex object. Um, that's, two what, billion that's where you have two billion languages. Yes, right? <laughs> if you had two, two billion, billion tweets, First tweet the yes. second one. Yeah. So I actually came across that problem in my mind early on, thinking, yeah, we're going to have that problem. Uh -huh. And yeah, no, we haven't had that problem. But I actually built our public timeline that way. So each one is based, is the, the index for the row key is actually a date. And then it goes out this way. So you, know, you might have, you know, whatever, 100,000 uh, posts one day, 55,000 the next day, 30,000, you know, two, <laughs> that sort of thing. So. Uh, Totally unnecessary, though, for what we did. It could have all been one row because we haven't had two billion posts yet. Um, <clears throat> so, when you have these dynamic, this dynamic data structure, you're going to have the opportunity to have it actually sort those posts that we were talking about. You can actually sort them by the column names. So there's this thing called a comparator. And as you define a column family, you define the row key, the data type for the row key. You also define the data type for the, the column names, so that you can actually sort it in a particular way. So you can actually have it written on disk the exact way you want it for whatever that purpose is. And again, uh, in the case of uh, timelines, you know, if you want to read it from uh, earliest to latest or vice versa, you can do it either way. And you can use a, a timestamp data type, a time UUID data type to actually do that. So um, the sortable column names uh, come in handy quite often. Um, so you know, rows can have static list of columns. That's where I was like saying, again, you can just write out exactly what you want it to be every time. It can look consistent. Or the dynamic list of columns, it can be sort of like a timeline. Um, and again, the rows can have variable lengths, variable number of columns each row. And then the data types. So, uh, so the row key uh, comment, uh, you know, you can be int, ASCII, UTF-8, lexical UUID, time UUID, byte types. There's like 12 of them. Um, too many to put on here. And uh, that can be used for columns and for row keys. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, and I'll just touch on it. Actually, I have something down here I didn't see. Um, Composite types. Composite types are what when I was talking about being able to, to model uh, complex objects. Uh, it's a little bit more advanced data modeling, but it allows you the ability to basically create like hashes of hashes or dictionary within a dictionary, a way to basically model uh, a multi-level object or hierarchical object. Um, that's that gets a little further into the weeds than we probably want to go into today. Um, <clears throat> originally, uh, the way you access the data was through Thrift um, and wrote some, uh, they were fairly straightforward, but you had very limited access to how you could actually get to the data. Uh, you could do something called a column family get, a column family insert. Uh, you can do things like get range, uh, a couple other features, but you don't have a lot of query power. That would be sort of like the one thing you have to be aware of when you're building your architecture using Cassandra is that you're not going to be able to do joins, order buys. You're not going to be able to do any of that stuff using the hardware you have at the database level. All that's got to have to happen if you got to do that, either one of two ways. Either you do it at right time, so you have all the data in the, the exact format you want it in, or whatever your language is that you're going to be taking it up to on, on the, the middle tier or the web tier, you're going to do the order by up there. You're going to do a loop over it and do some join, none of which are good ideas. Um, so that was it in the beginning. And now they've introduced something called uh, CQL, uh, which stands for Cassandra Query Language which is uh, very similar in nature to SQL, minus a few limitations. Uh, no joins, um, and uh, 
there's some limitations on the where predicate. Um, those are sort of the two biggest ones. But you can do select star from and treat a column family just like a table. Um, they actually, I believe, actually just recently uh, put in some order by functionality, which I haven't actually used yet. Um, but it, it, for those who know SQL, understand SQL, you don't have to kind of get down into the whole using these more primitive drivers that leverage thrift and do all this stuff, you can use CQL. Uh, most of the libraries now uh, support CQL uh, for accessing the data. Um, uh, so on the data design, so you, you, you kind of understand what the model's like, how you're gonna build things in it. So now it's like, well, okay, now how do I build an architecture? Well, the first and probably the most important thing is don't think of it like a relational database. Uh, you know, it doesn't have joins. Um, you know, you, you don't really want to do the order by because you're gonna end up doing it at your application tier for the most part. Um, so the two big things are think of it more like a denormalized data system, if, if you're familiar with that. Um, uh, denormalized relational database. So think of like, what is the question or what is the query that I want to call at some later time? And you want to model that into your writes. And so whenever you do a write, you're just doing a key lookup. Um, it makes things a lot easier and a lot faster. Now, there's a, there's a drawback to that. What happens if I have absolutely no idea how I want to do that at this time because I'm a brand new business and I want to do it every way because that's what every COO or CFO says. It's like, I want to read it this way and this way and this way. Well, you have a couple of choices. Uh, one choice is that you can write multiple versions. Think of them as like indices. Think of the column family as like building a materialized view of your data at write time. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to look at the orders in my system by date. I want to look at them by user. I want to look at them by product. You'd actually, those would be three queries traditionally. Now there are three writes into your system. So again, you've got lots of servers, probably lots of disk space behind it. Disk space is fairly cheap these days. You're making a trade-off. Your trade-off is you, you want to have the, the scalability um, at the system in exchange for having to do a little bit more work at right time. Yes? Can the column names be different per row, or, just, or do they always be the same? No, nope, they can be different per row. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't actually define when you create, the equivalent of create table is called create column family. You don't actually define any column names at that time. All you do is define the comparator, which is used to sort of sort the column names. So you have to stick within the confines of a data type. It's gonna be ASCII is what I'm gonna be putting in my columns, but I'm gonna have 300 columns, 10,000 columns, one column, doesn't matter. And if I have 10,000 columns, I don't have to have one that's consistent in every row. They can all be variable. So that's one way you could do it. <clears throat> the other solution to the, what I, I mentioned, there were two ways to do this. One is at right time, you know all the queries you want. Uh, the other one is that, um, and this is a little bit further, jumping ahead a little bit, but it's, it's a good question to bring up. Um, so Cassandra has this sort of ring topology, which allows you to have multiple nodes, servers. They're all part of this replication process. When you go to a multi-WAN, uh, multi-data center configuration, you define these things called virtual data centers. So you have a, a virtual data center in LA and a virtual data center in New York. The ring still exists as one entity, but they sort of slice it up and they sort of treat what's in LA as one thing. So you'll have a replication of three in here and you'll have a replication of three in New York, but your replication factor is still three. And that's the, you have to have three copies. When they divide the data center up into these two parts, what happens if the LA one disappears, right? It goes into the ocean. You still need to have three over there. So the reason why that is important is because you don't have to do, you don't have to have uh, physically uh, disparate data centers to take advantage of virtual data centers. What you can do is you can create a virtual data, um, several virtual data centers if you want inside one physical data center. You can make copies to those, that second virtual data center and there you can do all sorts of ad hoc querying, analytics, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Datastacks, which is the company that's uh, taking Cassandra and sort of turned it into a commercial product, has extended Cassandra in this way 
Uh, the core Cassandra can do this, but they've added some additional features, taking Hadoop and bringing it in. So now if you write your data one way, you can use like Hive or Pig or uh, write your own MapReduce stuff if you want, whatever, your language of choices, and you can manipulate that data on your own however you want to. It is sort of to what you're saying, you're gonna pull it out, you're gonna do some ETL type thing and then you shove it back in. That sort of has to happen in a traditional relational system oftentimes, you know, you have to pull it out into a data warehouse and you might be changing it, putting in an analytics cube, doing whatever you're doing. So it's not, sometimes when you're doing that, you don't have to change the data to actually do the query because Hive and Pig are pretty powerful and can do some things on their own where you don't have to like take it out and shove it in in a different manner. Um, and sometimes you will have to. Um, Let, let's put it this way, is it a bigger pain in the ass doing it this way in your experience or is it a bigger pain in the ass doing with relational database schema changes or what? Mm, that's a personal preference I think more than well, anything else. Well here like I, I, I might chime in because I've been like dealing with both like in a way. Um, the uh, reason like why you're using like the, the big data like the NoSQL uh, solutions is mostly like for um, like okay you're throwing like enormous amount of, of data there just running like the regular reports like you would run from again like against the MySQL database might not be feasible there at all because you might have like terabytes or like petabytes of data it's think of it as like okay you have this Apache log there you know if you want to run some kind of statistics on it you need to run the analysis script on that a uh, normal way of it to do it, like people run some kind of map produce uh, using Hadoop or like some kind of other um, like parallel analysis tools on it just to collect statistics. Okay, I need like these stats, you know, okay, how many like, you know, like female users in Alaska I have, you know, like <clears throat> um, it is, you not, not normally would not run the like reporting tool directly off the, the data set. And then the really cool thing, in my opinion, to answer your question about preference, because the replication happens to this other virtual data center, I now have, let's say, two machines that I can run some really nasty high MapReduce thing, peg the CPU, let it run for whatever, an hour, 24 hours, no impact on my customer-facing <coughs> data servers, none. Still getting the replicas, uh, the, the copies coming down in real time to the analytics server, so I can be doing analytics in basically near real time without me doing any ETL, anything else. If I need to answer your question in some fancy way, like there's some really complex thing the CEO or CFO wants, and I have to pull it out, put it in a text file, do some crazy stuff, and shove it back in. It seems like a small price to pay for the sort of sense of well-being that you have at night when you know you've got like multiple copies of your data and maybe in multiple locations with lots of servers supporting it. And you know, if you're not using uh, the Datastax product, you're using Cassandra, it's free. Those three of them. If you use Datastax, you know, there's, there's a, a support contract involved in it, but um, I like that. I, coming from my days doing uh, stuff, uh, you know, doing transactional sales on a single database when we'd have huge spikes and uh, we would grin and bear it and pray, uh, I prefer this. Again, personal preference. Um, so we talked a little bit about the replication uh, already. Um, the one really interesting thing here is the replication factor. So when you um, are putting a column family into Cassandra, you get to define for that one particular data object the replication factor or the number of copies of any given row within it that you want. So you can have table A or column family A and column family B, and they can have different replication factors. Um, we don't practice that, we just have the standard, we want three copies of everything, uh, but you have choice there. Uh, you can do it at what's called the key space level, and the key space level is the, the catalog that holds all of your, in a traditional database, it's the, the thing that holds all your tables is the catalog, and in, in uh, Cassandra they call it a key space holds all your column families. So you can do it at the key space level, and then you can override it at the column family level. Um, the hinted handoff and read repair, so we talked earlier about eventual consistency. When you're writing something into the system, eventually it has to, if I have three copies as my mandate, I gotta get three copies, right? So these two mechanisms are sort of built into the Cassandra um, replication system, and they make sure that either uh, when a server's down and it comes back up, hinted handoff basically says, hey, you missed all this data, and it basically hands over the data because it's been saved on another node, and that node is aware that another set of copies is waiting to be made to another server when that server comes online. And then read repair, um, <clears throat> let's say you're doing a, a query 
and you need a consistency level of one to give it like a dirty read in a relational database, but you still need three copies of it. When it does the read and it recognizes, hey, I'm gonna give you this row back, but oh, by the way, it hasn't made it to all three of the servers yet. The read repair actually can be triggered on a read to actually do the, the, the eventual consistency. So they've built in uh, a lot of mechanisms within the system <coughs> to ensure that consistency happens in a timely path. Um, the other really interesting thing about consistency is that it's tunable at query time. So what that really means is at write or read time, both being queries, you can define the level of consistency you want. Um, so the best way to think of that is at write time. If I want a consistency level one, I just need to make sure one machine gets a copy of that data and I'll get a response back. If I say it's gonna have three, it's actually gonna do the copy to all three servers before it sends a response back. So obviously three, four, five, and the higher the number, the longer the query takes to actually return. You said three copies, is that for the free repair for going? No. Uh, three copies, so that if one gets corrupted, then it, yep. the majority will see what's been repaired? I'm not sure I'm following the question, I'm sorry. Okay. Three copies, you yes. can yourself on three copies yep. of data. Yep. So that, is that for like, if, if one copy, like one byte goes bad in one, you look in the, the corresponding location of the two others. Um, to see which is the correct. You're saying that's read repair? No, is that why you have three copies? Oh, no, no, well, I mean, that's one reason. No, I just want it for more of the ability, like if you lose a server or you have disk failures or anything like that, it's more for that reason. I mean, it's really for any reason where you might have data corruption or data loss. Replication. Yes. Um, but the, so back to the, the consistency level, when you're writing a record in, maybe you only care that it gets to one location. It still means you're gonna have a replication factor of three in the, in the example we're talking about. So you're eventually gonna get that copy to three other machines, or two other machines, sorry. But initially, it only has to be successful at once. Um, so you'll have a faster write before the, with a response back to your, your application tier. Um, the other side of that coin is you can do a read. Yes? Yeah, just a question uh, regarding that. Let's say you have one of your servers is down. Mm -hmm. With the, if you do a query for that read, um, you said you would get the response only back once all uh, three replicated or copies are replicated. Right. But what is in the case if one of those targets is down? Uh, so in, in, if you have, say, three machines and only three machines, and you have three copies of the data, or you, that's your, your requirement is to have three copies of the data, and <clears throat> you have one machine go down, uh, when you do that right, um, you will... If I remember correctly, you will actually have a, a problem with that. Um, we don't typically run uh, with just three machines and a copy of three. So you have the ability to hopefully not have more than one server down at a time without somebody you know, getting on it and taking care of it. So you can actually then have three copies, say, on five machines. So they're spread out. It's sort of striped around the, the ring. And so in that scenario that you're describing, if you have three machines and three copies, you'll have you'll have a problem. I mean, you'll, you'll have a system down problem. You, you you won't be able to write right. So then you cannot write all the copies that you have set for your copy level because one system somewhere. Well, no, but at, at consistency level of three, you won't even get the right in because it can't say I got all three. So if you did a consistency level of one, it'll write it to one machine. It'll at a later date it'll attempt to write to the other two, doing one of these two and there's a third mechanism that, that, that can accomplish that. But at the time that it tries to do the eventual consistency, it'll note that it can't do three and it has, it has one in wait, so to speak. But the write was still successful because when you did the write, you said you only needed one. Now, if you have three machines and you say, I have to have all three respond with, we got it, but one of them's down, you're not gonna be able to do anything. You're gonna have a down system. So in that scenario, if you have to have three copies and you only have three machines, you don't really have a lot of flexibility in case one server goes down. So maybe you want to start off with four machines and maybe a replication factor of two. So you have flexibility. So you have to think about those things as you're, you don't have to do anything special to the replication architecture. You just have to kind of plan that in your mind as you're doing this stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I Maybe I can explain it afterwards a little bit better. Um, I mean, ultimately, if you demand three and you don't even have three servers, you're just not going anywhere. You're going to have, you're going to get uh, errors back from Cassandra saying it wasn't able to do that right, and then your application is going to 
do whatever it does to tell the user it was unsuccessful. Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that, assuming you have two servers on Ray, and is that easy to do the like master master thing? On oh yeah, it's built in. It's built in. There's no every node is equal to every other node. There's every no masters on those. How do you solve the uh, we'd have to ask data stacks because that's all built into uh, the, the replication architecture. There's no concept of master or slave, and one one has authority over the other. No, but if you have master master, it's inevitable there is some conflict, right? Not the way they architected it. So I, I mean, I don't know the details at that low level of how they're doing that that piece that you're referring to, but uh, that's not uh, it's not an issue. They they have a uh, we use a uh, time UUID to actually do a timestamp of every record at a particular point in time, and they are able to coordinate that in such a fashion that that doesn't happen. But the actual inner workings of how that works, I'm not I'm not uh, aware of the inner system. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My scenario is if you have machines in New York in Los Angeles, and there's data being entered in both sides, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, you're going to have you're going to have the consistency of one when the data gets put into at least one machine. So mm -hmm. I'm saying let's say this data is being entered in two different locations mm -hmm. across the country, mm -hmm. pretty much, and the consistency one is still one mm -hmm. basically until all the data is put into only one, one at least one device. You have the consistency. Right, but you're going to have two different timestamps for the two records that were written in. So I'm assuming I'll take that the example a little bit further. Let's say I'm updating my, my user record. Uh, let's say you're updating in New York and I'm updating in LA, right? Yeah. And so it's one record. Your no, 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 I'm, I'm dealing with different data being entered. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm updating my own record. Mm -hmm. You're updating your own record. Right. Someone's trying to go query, including your okay. own Yep, yep. When you start to go into different roles, that's what it sounds like. That the, that the New York and the Los Angeles guys are entering different roles in the same data. Yes, that's what, that's what you're describing, yes. But the question really is, is what then? Because that sh won't actually be a problem. No, I'm not saying that's a problem. I'm oh, okay. saying the consistency of one will only be achieved at the moment that the data goes to both places completely in, in the system. I just want to verify that that's what we're Oh, doing. I see what you're saying. Yes. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah. so you're saying partitioning is automatic? Mm-hmm. There's so, no pre-configuration, nothing? No, so the... So, it's tied into replication. So in an example where you would have five machines in, in this ring, yes. uh, but your replication factor, which for argument's sake, is three up on every data m model throughout the system. So let's say you have five column families. They all have to have, every row in all five column families has to have three copies, a replication factor of three. But you have five machines. So the partitioning, meaning I have five machines, there's going to be some set of three over here, there's going to be another set of three over here, there's going to be an overlapping set of three here. All of that, the partitioning within the ring, all happens inside Cassandra. There's, once you've defined the replication factor and the number of servers that are participating in the ring, the rest happens below, down inside the, the, the Cassandra layer. It's not something that you, you know, you don't, like in traditional systems, you create table with a partition of A, B, and, you know, B, B, and whatever. You don't have to do any of that. There's, there's a token architecture that you can futz with, that's probably the best way to put it, which you can control the partitioning, um, but you don't really need to do that. Um, there's some values that you can set up at the beginning, and once you've done that in the config file, and when you start up the server, you're done. You don't, every data model doesn't, or every data object or table, whatever you want to think of it as, doesn't need to have partitioning defined at the schema level. So do you call them a uh, ring of servers? Is, is that because each each node knows about all the other four nodes? Uh, yes, uh, they all know about <laughs> yeah. each other, but ultimately yeah. they also know about who's next to each other. That's sort of the more important purpose. Okay. Um, but they all know, yes, they're all in coordination and are aware of, they all know how to query each other to get data as they need to. So when you add a new one, you configure it, you tell it which which one is the next node, and that's it, or do you? Well, you don't have to do it that way. That's one way you can do it. You can also like inject yourself between two nodes. So if the if the ring topology has say from zero to a thousand are these tokens that I'm at you know point 
100, 250, 450, 650, and whatever, 900, right? I can bring in another machine between the 250 and the 450. Um, I can manually do this and enter it into the system at like 325 in the ring. Now the ring isn't balanced. It's out of balance because now there are three machines participating in, in an area where two used to participate. So they won't have an equal amount of partition data. Uh, so there's mechanisms now that if you use, specifically if you're using Datastax's product, they have something called Op Center, and Op Center basically can do all this configuring for you. You just check the box and <laughs> it does the rest. Um, so you can manually do it if you want to, or you can you know, have it auto set up. Uh, and it's, there's no reason in my opinion to go to the level of doing it manually. It was sort of how it was, and now that it automatically can do this, if you tell it to do so, it's sort of like, you might as well let it do that. Um, let's say if you fire up a new uh, server to handle the low balancing some of the, the um, peak level, mm -hmm. can you increase the, the CPU and the RAM on the new Cassandra server you kick up? Or it has to be identical from one to the next? Oh, no, they can be whatever heterogeneous. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, my, Get slightly strange performance, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we kind of touched on this a little bit already about the I/O performance. Um, you know, everything writing fast, and then eventually they got uh, fast reads. But the, the two interesting things to take away from the I/O performance are that they do all their writes sequentially. They write to memory, and they write to the pen log that's on disk. Um, and then what ends up happening is at some point, it's at a predetermined time in the future, what will happen is what's written in memory actually gets flushed to disk into these things called SS tables, and they're, they're immutable. Once they're there, they're done. You don't, if you're doing a delete, you're not deleting the record out of there necessarily. Um, at a later date, if you do a delete, it gets marked in another file or in memory, depending on where it's happening. Uh, at, like you've deleted a row, and at some point later there's what's called a compaction phase, and the compaction phase will actually eliminate the data during the compaction of these SS tables. Um, but that stuff all happens sort of as part of a background process, and doesn't actually put too much load. There's major compactions, they can put some load on the system, but you don't normally run those, uh, and there's minor compactions that kind of sweep the system, kind of like garbage collection, if you want to think of it that way, that will keep the system in pretty good shape on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, the other thing is that uh, they, they recommend that you, all your writes be item potent, so they're replayable, so that they can be, they can keep your, your data in a consistent fashion. Um, so that's something that from an architectural standpoint, when you're de developing your application, you, you, you want to keep that in mind. If you don't do that, theoretically you could run into some problems. Um, might not always work so well in, in sort of transactional systems for banking and things of that nature. You might have to architect it in a different way than your traditional relational. Yep. So you, you can replay the writes out of order. Is it, mm -hmm. is it because it's time stamped mm -hmm. and it'll take the last one by the post? So yeah, well, it'll play them all in the order that they were written to the append log, and you know, it'll just replay it in that order. So just as long as you you're keeping, however you've written your application, you've kept that in mind as you've written it, it should be fine. Um, and it's used for like when a node goes down and it needs to replay something off that commit log, you can do so. And uh, you know, again, with the writes being, you write once, it goes into memory, it goes into a location, eventually gets written to disk, it's, it's immutable at that point, that, that's why you need that item. Um, so a lot of these different pieces that we've talked about allow you to scale in Cassandra. Uh, rumor has it, can't say that I actually know this for a fact, that there's like a 900 node system in the, the, the defense department. Um, that's rumor. Um, but uh, you can add machines and you can remove machines. They can get integrated into the ring that we talked about earlier. Um, and so, you know, your, your system's flexible at this point. You can, on a heavy day, you could add more CPU on a bigger machine or just add four more machines if they were small machines, it's up to you assuming you can get your hands on the heart. Um, and again, with this multi-data center, uh, center topology, not only can you do this virtual data center for the purposes of analytics, transactional data, they've recently integrated solar into Cassandra, uh, into the data stacks product. Um, so you can have analytics and search and transactional uh, virtual data centers. 
Um, not only can you do that, but you can actually just have virtual data centers in physically different locations. So you can scale further that way as well. Uh, things that are typically pretty hard to do. Um, just a couple of notes about what we're doing to kind of wrap this up. Um, so we chose Python um, and Tornado as our web framework. Uh, we use something called PyCasa, which uh, is an official uh, Python driver uh, for Cassandra. There's a PHP Casa that's also a uh, official driver for PHP. Uh, we actually have adopted uh, the DataStax Enterprise product. We actually have deployed the Solar, Hadoop, and Cassandra components. Uh, we specifically use Hive, uh, and our uh, infrastructure is hosted at AWS. Um, and uh, we've talked about some future nodes. How do they like Solar's? Oh, um, so right now we have uh, four Cassandra nodes two search nodes and two Hadoop nodes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and it's all in one data center. We haven't done the multi-center uh, uh, configuration yet. You don't, um, you don't use PIC? Uh, we're looking into it. We chose Hive, and now we're kind of thinking we're going to end up with both. Uh -huh. What instance sizes and how much space are is your four node Cassandra? Um, we're doing the extra large configuration. The, I think it's called M1 extra, XL, if I remember correctly. It's the one with 16 or 15 and a half gigs of RAM and I don't know how many CPU units. Um, and how much disk space? I actually don't know off the top of my head. Are you EBS mounted or? Yeah, we are actually EBS. Uh, actually, no, no, no. We were, and we're not anymore. Okay, we went to, uh, to ephemeral drives. We were, and uh, we changed that like a Release or two ago, we've been kind of in this little tumultuous state where we've been upgrading a lot because Cassandra has been moving quite quickly recently, and uh, all of a sudden we need a new feature. Oh, there it is! And, and so we've done like three upgrades and a couple of hardware swap outs. We used to run M1 larges, and we went to M1 extra larges, and then we added the solar. Solar actually ran as a separate component, like traditional solar with master slave, and now we've done this one, which is no longer the master slave architecture. Um, it leverages the replication that's built into Cassandra to support the indexing for uh, solar. Um, so we've been changing it quite a bit. I'm sorry to hog up the... No, but just one more yeah, question. Yeah, sure. So this is all nice in theory. In practice, do you need, do you have developers that need to uh, create apps that connect to Cassandra? Mm -hmm. Do you have a developer Cassandra? So that's question number one. Do I develop in Cassandra? Like the developers, Java layers? when they need oh. to hit Cassandra, uh -huh. they hit their own Cassandra server? Do they have to set up their own? That's number one. Number yeah. two is the unit testing. So I'm unit testing my uh, code, and they need to hit some data layer. Do, mm -hmm. Is there a memory mock Cassandra that you use, or do you actually hit an actual instance of Cassandra when you're doing testing? We actually have uh, multiple. Um, environments, I guess is the best way to think of them, uh, at uh, AWS, so we have like a dev, QA, and production um, infrastructures, and we actually currently copy our, our Cassandra database isn't so large that we can't copy it, uh, although it's painful to do. It takes, uh, you know, a weekend to get it all over and down, and it's, it's we don't do it very often, um, but uh, the developers hit those um, directly, uh, and th what was the second question? Uh, for unit tests. Oh, so unit test. typically in a unit test, you yeah. create a completely new table. Yep. And then you, you want to have multiple instances of that running because mm -hmm. developers are checking to see if the code works. So if you're hitting the exact same development instance, yep. it's going to be conflicts. Yep. So what do you do in that case? Do you have a mock instance that they could use, or you know, they're actually hitting a, a real Cassandra? It's kind of on a case by case basis. <laughs> um, like. My laptop right now is actually running Cassandra, and I'm, I'll spin up objects in there and do some work against it, and you know, do whatever I need to do. And I mean, it's obviously not against a lot of data, but uh, you know, I can do the development that way. And we have, um, we actually did at one point. We bought Parallels, and we built a whole VM, sort of like the AMIs of Amazon, and we had those in source control, and we went that route, and that just seemed kind of painful. Um, now we actually give developers their own account at AWS, and we set up AMIs that they can just deploy, and so they can set up a, a, a small cluster of their own and do whatever they need to do if they're 
we basically, all of our team that does back-end deployment, uh, back-end development, is all using Amazon as much as we can. We, we stopped trying to do it in-house in any way, shape, or form. Um, how, uh, how much for the data stacks and the price? How much the cost? Free, the product is free. It's the, the support license. That oh, support. How much for support? Well, there are different levels of support. Uh -huh. uh, it's on a per node basis, and I don't actually know the numbers off mm. the top of my head, but you know, you can buy like three nodes of support and have 12 nodes running. If yeah. you find out you have 12 nodes running and, they've called about, and you're calling about four nodes being down, I'm not really sure what they're going to do for you. <laughs> but uh, it's not particularly expensive. I think it was... I don't, I don't want to quote a number. I, 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 it was a couple thousand dollars a note, if I remember correctly, but I, the amount of change, it was two years ago we made that contract, so uh -huh. it's been a while, or a year and a half ago. Um, so uh, just some future use cases. Uh, so we have all of our user-generated content, and Gamefly is actually in relational databases still, and we're thinking of moving a lot of that out to uh, the cloud to, to, to our Cassandra implementations. Um, we have a need for, in the mobile team, we want to uh, replace uh, a cloud service we use for push notifications. Uh, they're, they're a little pricey. So we've been experimenting with uh, building a, a socket architecture that can use Cassandra as a backend message uh, persistent layer. Um, so that's that looks pretty promising. And then uh, lastly, we are going to eventually do the multi-data center deployment. Um, just a couple other things. Uh, if you guys are interested in data modeling, um, Nat Dennis, he, he works at, uh, at uh, DataStacks. He has a really good uh, presentation on data modeling and availability. He can probably fill you in on some more details than, than I can. Uh, he's been working there for over two years. Um, and then uh, if you really want to get down into the nitty gritty of data modeling, the, the way that column families came to be, so to speak, um, they're based on big table. So there's a, a good article uh, from Google I don't remember what year it is. I think it's 2005, maybe, uh, on, at that URL. And then uh, the CTO of uh, AWS um, wrote a really interesting article on replication and how Dynamo did that. This is the replication. That's the ring topology that we're talking about. And these are the, the core foundations of Cassandra. So those are some good articles. And then lastly, uh, uh, there's a new meetup group starting, uh, Cassandra meetup that uh, we mentioned earlier. It's starting uh, the 18th, was it? 16th. Uh, the 16th in LA. Uh, Call Fire is going to be hosting it this time. And uh, I'll be there. Thank you very much. So, uh, quick question. How do you manage the server? So, you, so you, you have a ring of nodes, right? Mm -hmm. How do you inform each other that they are uh, in the ring? No, no the, well, you could do both. We don't you do the latter, we do the former. Um, right now, it's kind of manageable with our eight machines. Um, I know companies like Netflix use, <laughs> this is kind of funny, they use SimpleDB, which is Amazon's like relational product, and they store mm -hmm. stuff in there, and then they query that at, at startup time to figure out what other nodes are in the system, and then they modify that text file because the text file is part of Cassandra, so Cassandra needs that to, to know how to do what it needs to do. So they use that simple DB thing as like an active directory type, you know, a directory lookup system to inform the rest of their architecture of what they need. What is it? That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you in the back? I'm sorry. Um, is, this, is this presentation going to be available? Like, can you just like email out these decks? Uh, yeah, I can figure out something. Whether it's SlideShare or I don't know if there's an email list, but uh, we'll figure it out. So the application you use get using for Cassandra is good for like I guess messaging and user data. Is that what you're using it for? for? So uh, yeah, I mean it's social. It's kind of like we built like our version of Twitter, and mm -hmm. we it's deployed on our iOS and Android applications, mm -hmm. and we have a digital client that's uh, uh, installable for your desktop that runs on a, a, an Adobe uh, framework, Air framework, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're looking to bring it to <laughs> the web. Uh, soon. <laughs> Lastly, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's basically just a messaging architecture. We actually have a second use for it, um, where we do some uh, clickstream type tracking. Uh, mm -hmm. Very small for one particular product that we have, 
or one specific small use case. Um, it actually generates more data than our social system, though, which is kind of funny. But um, so you got on all this, but you haven't got on the web yet. On the, on <laughs> <Yeah>. the <laughs> that's not by choice. We actually have a, a functioning mobile web uh, product uh, that our product team will let us. That's fly. awesome. That is uh, the messaging thing that I said on two slides ago. Um, we're actually trying to do, we, we looked at the, so we've been, it's a little off subject, we did all of our mobile web stuff in Node, Node.js, and uh, so we've been experimenting with uh, doing socket IO. That didn't really work as well as we'd like it to at scale. So mm -hmm. now, we're, now we're actually looking at doing Node with um, just keep alive connections and uh, that seems to be working pretty well uh, inside the node architecture. Um, so we have a client that does the connection, and then we just push out through that keep alive session, each each socket. Um, and then with further questions, can you talk about latency and security? Security. There isn't a whole heck of a lot of security currently in Cassandra, to be honest. Uh, I believe <laughs> their next major release is addressing that. What they're doing, I don't know. Uh, and latency, what in particular are you looking? Well, one of the big open problems when I was working on it was, um, again, a couple years back, is that if some node links were much slower mm -hmm. than other ones, first of all, the talking between the two was very hot heavy, and you had to go back around trips. And the other one is that there was no I'm not sure I'm the right person to, to get down to that level of detail. I, my experience has been that when a, one server becomes bogged down, it hasn't brought down the system. So they must have addressed those problems in some fashion. How they did it, I don't know the details on. Um, but I can also say that our system, you know, gamer, gamer tweeting, for lack of a better way of thinking about it, on mobile phones is not anywhere near the scale that you're probably talking about. You know, our scale is much, much lower than whatever it was that you were working on a couple of years ago, I'm guessing. We, you know, we, only, we don't even have it on the web yet, so it's, uh, you know, it just doesn't have the type of throughput. We're not pushing the type of throughput that I think you came up against. Does it have the type of uh, caching performance that Solar has? As you know, with Solar, you know, with our caching is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. In my experience with Cassandra, it didn't really do that that well. Um, is that the same still? Uh, well, there's queue level caching and there's row level caching, and depending on which one you're looking to use, uh, like row level caching, you're gonna probably run out of memory pretty fast. Um, so we tend to use only key level caching, uh, and key level caching is fast, but you still have to sometimes go to disk if it's not currently in memory, um, as opposed to pinning it into memory with row, row cache. Um, so it's pretty fast if you ask me, but you know, it also depends on your configuration, number of servers, how much memory you have, how much you can put into memory. It's all tunable, so it's really more about how you set it up. What's a uh, key difference between Cassandra and DynamoDB? Yeah? They are look from the same, you know, feed table, right? But what's different? I'm not a Dynamo expert, so I'm not sure I can help because you. Because Dynamo is available in the yep. AWS, right? But you don't use Dynamo, you use the Cassandra. Well, this was around before Dynamo was available for us. Oh, I see. So Dynamo has only been around for six or seven months. As a yeah, right, right, service, right, right. right. Like yeah. This has been something we've worked on for almost two years now. Um, I did experiment very briefly with Dynamo, and uh -huh. it, it, it seems similar. Yeah. So I'm not sure I can say that. You know, they don't, I don't think they call them column families. I can't remember what they call them. I think they just call them tables. Right, but the, the, the data structure that goes into it, don't they call them uh, tables? Anyway, they're probably pretty similar at this point, would be my guess, but I mm -hmm. don't have a lot of Dynamo experience. They have okay. a secondary index. They only go up to 64 megabytes per chunk. Oh, okay. And you pay per volume request. Did you say they do have secondary indices? Yeah. Cassandra does too. Yeah, Cassandra oh, has a secondary, oh, yeah. and the same. Yeah. So you missed out. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Actually, let's get back to the uh, latency question. Uh -huh. What do you do for for monitoring? So when you monitor your system, as you know, AWS instances aren't very reliable at times. Sure. When it goes down, you should see some graph that says, oh, one node is down, here's my latency, it goes mm -hmm. up, or mm -hmm. here's my load. What do you what do you do for monitoring? So just to be aware of those problems occurring? Right, just to see the performance of your system. Uh, well, we use the, the Ops Center product that is free from uh, data center. So, um, but what we actually use is uh, we use uh, CloudWatch and we use, uh, I get the name of it, it's not sites here. It's another product that we outsource to uh, that we use to, to hook into the systems and, and, and get uh, email alerts when we when we reach thresholds. So an example of that is oftentimes when we're doing that major compaction I mentioned earlier, the CPU will spike up pretty high, uh, so you try not to do that. Um, and uh, we'll get alerts when that happens. No, well, we use Munin to, to monitor it, but we don't have Munins actually sending us uh, alerts. We have another third-party product uh, that's sending us the alerts, and then we use CloudWatch also can set uh, alerts based on metrics within the system. Any other questions? Okay, uh, last question. <laughs> Why don't you use uh, Java? Java is is not good for oh, Cassandra? No, no, I'm sure it's perfectly fine. It just didn't really fit with what we wanted to do. When we first built this, we were two people, mm. uh, and we wanted to be able to hop on to a system in need at any point in time and be able to make a change and not have to compile it and want to be able to take it out of the system. We wanted full flexibility everywhere, and we felt that a dynamically typed language gave us a little bit more flexibility than a statically typed language. Something that you have to compile and then you have to upload it. You know, we can make a change in Tornado and you can, if you have it in debug mode, it'll automatically recognize that the change has occurred and it'll restart on its own and you don't have to like compile things. You can change one line, you know, one character in one place and it just, it'll run. Not that you should do debug mode in production. <laughs> I'm not saying to do that. Um, but, you know, you have those options uh, and that kind of flexibility and, and we were we were concerned with our limited resources. We needed all the flexibility we could have. Good. Extremely briefly, what are the other technologies in your staff which you have yet mentioned? <laughs> what are the other things out there? Uh, pretty much covered it all for what we're doing. Um, I mean, we use Linux. We use Ubuntu Linux at uh, Ubuntu? Okay. AWS, uh, Solar. Okay, what was your file system? What's your web server? Things like that. Like Tornado's the web server. Uh, we actually use Nginx, I didn't mention that, to do a reverse proxy because Tornado, Python, single-threaded, so we run a multiple Tornadoes per machine uh, for as many cores as there are on the machine. And then we run... We just uh, ELB down to, you know, doing a sort of a round-robin down to each uh, web server. Each web server has Nginx, which then actually forks off and we have four tornadoes running on each machine, and those call down into Cassandra, and we just use Cassandra's caching for now. And then we solar for search, and we have Hive on the backside for doing our analytics. Is it just vanilla EXP3? Or? I, again, we're not, you know, I don't think we're quite on the scale of some of the larger organizations that need the super high performance stuff. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.